Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there he is, in the flesh. It is a real privilege to host this Intelligence Squared event at the Royal Festival Hall in London, where two and a half thousand people have come to listen and ask questions of a former US president. And after a period of questions from me, he's going to be taking some from the audience. President Carter is a man who doesn't honestly need an introduction. A former US submariner, peanut farmer, the 76th governor of Georgia, as governor, he called for an end to racial discrimination. As president, he championed the environment long before most people had ever even heard of global warming. He pardoned those who evaded the draft during the Vietnam War. He negotiated the treaty that transferred the control of the Panama Canal to the state of Panama. The Camp David Accords led to a lasting peace between Israel and Egypt. And he put human rights at the very heart of his foreign policy. He was the president when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and when a revolution in Iran swept away the Shah. And for 444 days, he worked tirelessly to free American hostages held in Tehran. A dramatic rescue mission failed, and many say it was that that cost him a second term as president. The hostages were released 20 minutes after he left office in January 1981. Since leaving office, he has, among other things, created the Carter Center, which monitors elections around the world, advances human rights, and has led the effort to rid the world of guinea worm, which will be the only the second disease in human history ever to be eradicated. He continues to call for peace between Israel and its neighbors, and the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. And he serves as one of the elders, a group of independent world leaders working for peace and human rights, which was brought together by Nelson Mandela. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in again welcoming the Nobel Peace Prize laureate and 39th President of the United States, the man from Plains, Georgia, President Jimmy Carter. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Mr. President, religion has been very present in your life. Um, it, it's still present, and you teach a Sunday school whenever you're home in Plains. Um, I'm just wondering what you make of religion in American politics today. Gridlock in Congress, uh, elected representatives who have quite a fundamental view of the Christian faith. What do you make of religion in American politics? Well, I think the correlation of religion and uh, politics is improper in our country. If it means that um, there's any expression by an incumbent president or even a candidate of a preference for one religion over another. And although we have a very large Christian community, and I am a Christian, I'm an evangelical Christian. As you say, I teach the Bible every Sunday when I'm at home. I think that the uh, separation of church and state is a very important element of our society that should be restored, not much preserved because it's violated quite often now. But um, there was a melding uh, of the right-wing, very conservative religious community and the right-wing, very conservative Republican Party about 25 or 30 years ago. And that still is a, an important factor, but I think it's less important now than it was five or six years ago. Really, because, yes, I, I mean, if we, if we look at the Republican lineup for the presidential, and it's still very much in the mix, but if, if, you, if you look at uh, Governor Rick Perry of Texas, sure. I mean, this is going some. I know, but they're not going to win. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you don't need me to tell you that these are awful times economically for many of Well, they are Americans. in our country and also in Europe. There's no doubt about that. And that opens up a kind of ugly space, a space where people are looking for messianic leaders, if you like. Um, That's true. And there, there are radical elements that are building up both in my country and yours. I think we've basically in the last few years abandoned, for instance, the growing commitment to do, deal with global warming. That's almost a dead issue now. There's nobody much talking about it. And uh, in our country, the, um, the main target uh, of people who uh, are attacked in the Republican Party, at least, are immigrants. 
And of course, throughout almost every country in Europe, there's an aversion now that's a really a, a new coming and very disturbing trend to condemn people who haven't been living here for a long time as an, intruders who might compete for a job. So I think that's a, an element of racial prejudice that has intruded itself upon the political system and the social system as a result, perhaps, of a weakened economic system. You say you're confident that uh, President Obama will win. You see, I'm wondering whether you don't feel a sense of disappointment because many of the causes that you really espouse and have worked tirelessly ever since you became president, and even when you were president, yes. have in some ways um, fallen down on his watch. And I would raise most specifically the matter of Israel-Palestine. You want me to comment on that? I do. I'm wondering, <laughs> I, I, well, I'm, I'm wondering, for example, I mean, I imagine you would absolutely have stood by his view yes. that there should be no more settlements absolutely. built in Palestinian territory. I was very excited um, when President Obama went to Cairo and said that a policy of my nation and my government is no more Israeli settlements in Palestine. And this sent a wave of a hope and aspirations for the Palestinians finally to get some basic political and human rights. And uh, of course it was rejected in its totality by the Netanyahu regime. And then I was also encouraged this past uh, May when President Obama repeated the policy that all his predecessors have had since Israel was a nation, uh, since 1967 at least, that Israel should withdraw from the occupied territories except for the 1967 borders modified. And uh, apparently he's abandoned that as well. Now, when he made his recent speech in the United Nations, there was no mention of 67 borders. And uh, I think this- So uh, what do you think is happening? I think it's the political pressures within our country from, from the uh, supporters of Israel. And I'm a supporter of Israel, I might add to say, my hope, my number one uh, international dream and prayer has been to bring peace to Israel. I was involved in the so-called Geneva Accords. I, in fact, I was involved in the negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and I made the keynote speech at, the, at Geneva when it was announced. And it called for leaving half of the Israelis settlers in Palestine in exchange for some property of Israel that would go to the Palestinians to modify the borders. And when I was speaking on the last time I had a long discussion with uh, Ariel Sharon, very conservative uh, prime minister, as you know, Sharon had accepted that premise. In fact, he pointed out to me a very intriguing idea. He said, why doesn't Israel give to the Palestinians a, a land corridor between Gaza and the West Bank, which is about 36 miles, and then let them build on that corridor a railroad and a highway. It'll be owned by the Palestinians as a land swap, and the Israelis will maintain uh, security and uh, when the Israelis want to go from one part of the Negev desert to another, they would just go under a tunnel or over a bridge and let the Palestinians have that land. So all of the predecessors of Netanyahu have accepted the premise that Israel must give up the occupied territories in order for, to have peace. This is what everybody knows as a two-state solution. Netanyahu and Lieberman and others are now moving inevitably, apparently to me, to a one-state solution where there's only gonna be one nation between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea controlled ostensibly by the Jews, the Israelis. But uh, this can't uh, lie. A state about which you, you dared to conjure the word apartheid. It, that's the prospect. Yeah, that's what's gonna happen. So you, you're either gonna have, uh, right now there's a, there are a majority of non-Jews in that one state, but they're not a, a majority of non-Jewish voters yet because the Palestinians are younger in age but it's just a few years before there'll be a majority of non-Jews in that one state area. And Israel will be faced with an with a impossible choice, either have uh, part of their citizens deprived of a right of citizenship, that is the non-Jews, or to let the Arabs outvote the Jews in their own country. So you can see this is inevitably moving toward a tragedy, in my opinion, for Israel. But apparently that's what Netanyahu is, is trying to do. There is another side to the equation, and that, of course, is the preparedness by Hamas and others yes. to accept the right of Israel to exist. They're all prepared to do that. The Quarter Center is one of the few organizations in the world that, that deals with all the aspects of the 
peace process in the Middle East with Israel, with Lebanon, with Jordan, with, with uh, Syria, with Egypt, and with Hamas, and also with uh, Fatah, of course. And all of the Arab countries, as you know, have made the so-called Arab peace proposal to recognize Israel diplomatically and an equal trading partner if Israel will just do what I just said, withdraw basically to the 67 borders. And uh, Hamas leadership have announced publicly and told me privately that they will accept the, um, Israel's existence within the 67 borders modified by negotiation. They've also said that they would, they would anoint uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the head of a C at PLO, to be their representative negotiator. And they will accept any, any deal negotiated by Abbas with Israel, provided the Palestinians have a right to vote on it in a referendum and approve the results of the negotiation. So I think there's adequate flexibility on the Arab side and in the past, there has been flexibility on the Israeli side. Now, apparently, that flexibility is gone. Where does all this in you come from? I mean, how did somebody who grew up in what was a very segregated state uh, was well, a southern state? Sure. How, how did you emerge as somebody who wanted an end to racial discrimination and who was prepared to countenance all sorts of international settlements like Israel-Palestine that many other people in America just can't cope with? Well, two things. One is that, I, as I say, I, I teach the Bible every Sunday when I'm home. Uh, half the time in the New Testament, half the time in the Hebrew text, the Old Testament. So I'm familiar with biblical history and with geography and so forth. But I think the, the racial issue about which you ask, I, I grew up in a community called Archery, uh, about two and a half miles outside the little town of Plains, which has about 600 people. Uh, there were 200 people in, in archery. We didn't have any white neighbors. All my neighbors were African American, were black people. So I grew up in a culture of, black, of the black community. I wrote a book about that called An Hour Before Daylight, which is still on sale, by the way. <laughs> um, and the BBC it, does not allow a commercial. I didn't make a commercial, no. <laughs> uh, just an announcement. But, uh, <laughs> But I, at the end of the book, I, I tried to think of the five people in my life, other than my mother and father, that shaped my life. And only two of those people were, were white. So I, I was immersed in a black culture as a child until I was 12 or 13 years old. My mother was a registered nurse, a m member of the medical profession, and she never paid any attention to racial segregation or racial distinction. So I think it was, it was that realization on my part as an evolving adult, that legal segregation under the Supreme Court ruling and the congressional action and so forth was a millstone not only around the neck of my black neighbors, but a millstone around the white people who were imposing our will on these people whom we considered to be inferior. And I knew from biblical teaching my religion and my mother that we were not superior and they were not inferior. Your family were peanut farmers. I mean, still, is, uh, still, still are. Still yeah. are. Uh, and I'm wondering how from this very small nut and its production, you found your way to becoming governor of Georgia and president of the United States. I mean, you must be a very ambitious, very competitive man. <laughs> that must be your downside. Well. <laughs> but you are competitive, aren't you? Somebody said, I think it was Hamilton Jordan said, your campaign manager, that you thought you could probably make a better turkey noise than a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, some people said they look at a calendar and I look at a watch, but, uh, <laughs> but yes, I, I have um, always had an inclination if I thought a goal was worthwhile, like at the Carter Center, you know, we devote our full time to making sure that that uh, prospect of success, although it might be remote, comes into reality, so I don't mind competing if I think the goal is proper. I've enumerated your, um, <laughs> well, some of your extraordinary achievements as president, but were you a good president, and would you be a better one now? Leaving out the question of age. Yes. Which is irrelevant. Yes. <laughs> would you be a better president now than you were no, I don't, think, I don't think so. This is a difficult time for any president. And it's an unprecedented uh, political atmosphere in my country. It never has prevailed before, except perhaps during the Civil War when we were act, actually uh, in conflict between the North and South. But there's a polarization in my country that is totally unprecedented. And it's brought about 
by the massive infusion of money into the political structure of America. You couldn't possibly expect now to be the Democratic or Republican nominee unless you could raise 200, 300, 400 million dollars. Obama will probably raise a billion dollars. Uh, when I ran for president against Gerald Ford, we didn't accept any contributions. In America, there's a, there was a law then and now that, that every taxpayer could, could put a little check mark on his income tax and it's $2. So he and Ford and I both, and later Reagan and I both, ran without any contributions. Our Supreme Court uh, of the United States, let's see, January before last, made the stupidest decision that the Supreme Court has ever made by ruling, in effect, that corporations are people and there's absolutely no limit on how much a corporation can give to political candidates. Even corporations in our country that uh, have foreign ownership, they can give as much money as they want to to any candidate, and they don't have to be revealed publicly where the funds derive. So this has is, this is meant now that, that, that people who are incumbent or who have some vote to sell in the future or in office have a plethora of money. And in almost every campaign now, the number one project is to tear down the personal reputation of your opponent, mm. the negative advertising. And although most American voters say it, we don't pay any attention to we don't like negative advertising, it really works. So that polarization at the local level carries over into Washington. This is unprecedented in our country. Your presidency ended in the appalling hostage crisis. Yes. Um, 444 days. I remember. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I was actually in Tehran yeah. uh, uh. for much of that time. And I wondered, how, you're a man of religion, did you, how did you feel about Iran immediately after you left office? They, they bamboozled you out of office in many ways. Well, I, I don't blame you for that, but uh, after the Shah was overthrown, I thought it was proper for me to have diplomatic relations with the revolutionary government, with the Ayatollah's government, and I did. They had a large number of diplomats in Washington. I had, as you know, a large number of diplomats in Tehran. And I don't think, I really don't believe personally that the Ayatollah knew ahead of time that the militant students were gonna take our embassy and capture our hostages. Later though, it evolved, as you know, into a long period of time. But I think, uh, I thought when I left office and, and now, that the United States should have diplomatic relations with Iran mm -hmm. and within the bounds of propriety and diplomatic niceties that we should have maximum communication between Washington and Tehran. I still feel that way because I believe that the human rights abuses in, in Iran could be lessened by beneficial United States influence. We're powerful enough to withstand, you know, we, reaching out a hand of, uh, of friendship, even though sometimes it may be rebuffed. Do you think that the world's response and America's response to 9-11 was right? At the beginning it was, yes. I think that um, immediately after 9-11, we had almost unanimous expressions of condolence and support from around the world, including in Tehran, by the way. But um, we have made serious mistakes since then. Uh, the worst mistake was when George W. Bush decided to invade Iraq, which I strongly opposed. I think that, that it was proper for the United States to go into Afghanistan. Uh, because that's where Al-Qaeda had solidified its uh, presence and support from the Taliban government and so forth. I think we had to go in and, and remove the threat of uh, Taliban strength. After that, instead of looking toward Iraq with totally false premises, and I think the leaders knew that they were false at the time, we should have stayed in Afghanistan and used a, a, a tiny portion of the money we've spent in Iraq to rebuild Afghanistan. And now, I mean, how, how would you see extricating from Afghanistan? Do you, do you the, believe that the... The, the sooner uh, the better. I well, think. but do you, do you believe the current uh, assassination of targeted individuals by drone is a, is, a, is, is, is a right thing? It's not something that I would have done, but I'm really not in a position to criticize President Obama for his decision. I, I don't want to be in that position. And the killing of um, Osama bin Laden? I think that was probably justified, yes. Osama bin Laden had, had deliberately killed more than 3,000 of my own fellow citizens. I think he deserved to be killed, yes. 
Do you think America has understood the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan? I know one of us has. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a general premise, uh, I would say a majority of Americans now, looking back on the lies that were told about uh, the situation in Iraq concerning weapons of mass destruction, I think now see that Iraqi invasion was a mistake, yes. How do you view the Arab Spring? With uh, surprise and excitement and uh, pleasure and uncertainty about the future. Uh, the Carter Center will be helping with the election in, in, uh, ter in, in uh, uh, Tunisia very soon. Uh, I was on the telephone last week with the Field Marshal Tantawi of Egypt. Uh, they are moving toward an election for Parliament first in the draft of a new constitution, the election of a president in 2013. Do you feel slightly uneasy about Egypt? I mean, the army is still in, in, a way, in, in control. In a way, I'm familiar with the army leaders, and, and as you probably know, ever since the time of, of Nasser and, yeah. and Sadat and, 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 and also Mubarak, the army has been in charge in Egypt of uh, military, political, and economic, and finance. Mm -hmm. The army has been totally dominant in all those respects. And I think that the military leadership now don't know them all, of course, we don't know many of them. I think they want to adhere to their position of dominance, not only in the military, but also in to the maintain economy. their economy, yeah. economic superiority. I think they'll give up as little political power as they can possibly do. How do you read the difference between the West's response to Libya and the West's response to Syria? Uh, they're two totally different things. Of course. And so far, there is a, a, some element of identification of a political leadership in, there, in Libya. My hope is that they'll move toward uh, democracy in, in a way. If they do, we'll offer our services as at the Carter Center to help with uh, the election itself. Uh, and uh, I think that the military invasion, uh, participation by the West in Libya, as you know, was limited. But I think that uh, to take a military position in Syria would be a much more serious thing. Uh, the Syrian government is, is ancient. It's, uh, it's been fairly enlightened in recent years until this uprising began. Um, and, and I think that the surrounding countries would deplore uh, severely uh, any Western intrusion into Syria. I don't think Turkey would, would approve of that, for instance, and, and neither would other countries that surround Although Syria. Although Turkey, interestingly, is uh, Critical. expressing great misgivings. Critical. I, as you know, the Turkish Prime Minister went to Syria and tried to induce them to back off from, from their military action to the mostly peaceful demonstrations. I don't know what's going to happen in Syria, but I don't think it's uh, at all possible for Western nations to take military action by invading or attacking Syria. Southern Sudan is something which you've really invested a yes. huge amount of effort in. I have. Um, it's going to be a huge mountain to climb, isn't it, to bring that country it has been. to development? We've been involved in Southern Sudan since 1988. I've been there often, all over Southern Sudan, as well as the northern part of the country. We've had major health programs there. We've negotiated uh, ceasefire agreements between the North and South. Uh, we were there for the registration of voters, for the election that took place throughout the entire country of Sudan April before last. Uh, we were there for the preparation of the referendum. Uh, we were also there when the referendum took place. And we are still deeply involved in, in Sudan. That South Sudan now has tremendous potential for a successful uh, administration. They are blessed with about 70% of all the oil in Sudan, which is fairly uh, substantial. So they have a, an economic base on which to build a new country. I just wanted to ask you a few personal questions. I mean, I wanted just to ask you um, what role in your life Rosalind plays? Is she the ambition in your life? Well, when Rosalind was born, I lived next door. <laughs> And when I was uh, you remember three, you remember her birth? No, but I, <laughs> I've been told by my mother that I used to go next door and look through the cradle at my future wife. Uh, she was three, she's three years younger than I. 
And we grew up in the same little town that has about 630 people. We, our families have been there since the early 1800s. We own the same land we did all that time. Uh, we, I fell in love with Rosen on my first date. Uh, six months later, I asked her to marry me. She said no. <laughs> um, and then five months later, she finally agreed to get married, and uh, that was 65 years ago. So we have a fairly good relationship. <laughs> yes. But Rose, you, uh, you still live in what we call a bungalow, and a very small one. We, we call a low-level house, yes. such as yours, but I've seen it because I've, I've been outside as a, as a journalist. Um, I mean, what, what, <laughs> what? You, you're welcome to come in next time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's what I was fishing for. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, I mean, most former presidents um, do tend to end up living rather graciously uh, in, in very large premises. <laughs> what is it? I mean, you didn't need anything more? No, not really. I, You've got in, a huge family. In a fairly weak moment after I was defeated and while I was still in office, I made a statement that I was going to emulate Harry Truman and not use my service in the White House uh, to enrich myself. And it may have been a, a mistake, but I, I <laughs> adhere to that. So I, I have made my income primarily from writing books. Uh, I've now finished 29 books. Mm -hmm. Uh, two of them will be published in the next few months. And, uh, I feel another commercial coming up. Well, <laughs> I'm not even going to announce the names of them. And I also get uh, the salary, I mean, the retirement of a president, mm -hmm. and I'm a full-time professor at Emory University, and I get a salary there, so I mm. have an adequate income. Mm. Now, I, I hope you don't mind me mentioning, but you're 87. Yes, that's um, right. And uh, that's a formidable age. Yeah, and uh, four days. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but you've had your knees... <laughs> You've had your knees fixed very successfully, yes, uh, only in the last few months. What is the secret? I mean, the, you seem to have completely boundless energy, uh, and you still seem to be competing for something. Well, my, almost my entire public life is devoted to the Carter Center, and we have a wide range of, of, of projects. We've had projects in more than 70 nations. It, not coincidentally, 35 of those countries are in Africa where the need is greatest. So almost every day we have uh, new challenges in life, uh, opportunities for adventure, unpredictability, excitement, mm -hmm. sometimes disappointment, sometimes gratification. So it's a very mm -hmm. wonderful life that we have. Uh, Rosa, yeah, but a lot of that's on a plane. I mean, you've come all the way over from Atlanta. You've yeah. been to the Netherlands on the way. I mean, you know, yeah, you, also, you're not thinking of slowing down. I'm thinking of it, but I haven't decided to do it yet. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good moment to open it up to the, uh, to the rest of the floor. Thank you very much I indeed for, for that. Um, uh, My name is Guy Strafford. Um, President Carter, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give an incoming American president today? Well, I think the main thing is for the United States to strive once more to be a genuine superpower. And, and this is a presumptuous thing on me. I'm not saying that I know more than others, but let, I'll try to answer your question as best I can. The United States now has um, the greatest military power. Our military budget equals almost the entire budget of all the countries combined on Earth. Six times more than the second budget, that's China's. And, and I would like to see our country become an entity that mirrored the highest ideals of an individual human being and collectively a nation. I would, I would hope that someday in the future that if a person or leaders in any country on earth that was faced with a potential conflict, their natural thought would be, let's go to Washington because America is a champion of peace. I think if you go around the world now and ask the people the United States relation to peace, they would say that we may be one of the most warlike uh, countries. I would hope that, that, that people throughout the world in the future, uh, if they had a chance for democracy, 
or a new government would say, why don't we go to Washington? Because America has evolved the finest example of democratic government on earth. Isn't that precisely what Obama promised, hope, uh, in precisely in those a, sort a of terms? And do you think the reason he has not been able to deliver is because he's defined the limits of power or because he was too inexperienced to do it? No, I don't think he was too inexperienced. I, he's been in the U.S. Senate, and of course I had been the governor of a state, but I wouldn't say he's inexperienced and so forth. I'm not criticizing Obama at all. But uh, I think that those commitments that are made at the beginning should be pursued, even though, though they are political obstacles that are almost insurmountable. Uh, I would like for the United States to be looked upon as a champion of uh, addressing environmental challenges, global warming. What is our present position on global warming? I don't know. Uh, human rights? I don't know. I would like for the United States to be the champion of uh, generosity in helping countries or people who are in need. Those are the kind of things that can be made uh, clear. And, and, and I hope that the future presidents will do this. And, and also the future prime ministers of, of, of Great Britain. I'm not singling out my own country, but, but great, powerful, secure nations th that have stable democratic governments ought to be in the forefront of, of all these kinds of issues that relate to peace, human rights, environmental equality, the alleviation of suffering, freedom, democracy, and, and let that be a commitment that is sound regardless of the political exigencies of partisanship within a country. Let's take uh, microphone three up in the uh, <laughs> Mr. President, uh, my name's John Hume, and I'd like to ask a question about uh, Korea, because it's over 20 years since the Cold War ended, and yet the situation in the Korean Peninsula remains really dangerous. I believe you visited it quite recently. Uh, could you give us some insight as to how that danger could be defused? Thank you. Yeah. North Korea. Yeah. Well, the Carter Center has uh, one characteristic that's very precious to us, and that is freedom. And even though my government might have a prohibition against going and becoming involved in another place, we don't have that restraint. Uh, for instance, I go to Cuba when I want to, and I've been to North Korea three times, uh, trying to uh, put a termination to the nuclear threat there. Uh, in 1994, I went to North Korea, met with Kim Il-sung, and I was able, with my wife, to negotiate a complete agreement between the United States and North Korea Korea, and Kim Il-sung agreed to do away with that nuclear program and, and, and do a number of other things. And, and that was stabilized and accepted by the Clinton administration. And as you may remember, our foreign, our Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, went to Pyongyang to confirm this agreement that I negotiated. When George W. Bush came in office, he canceled that agreement. And the North Koreans responded by resuming their nuclear program. I've been in North Korea twice recently, once with a group of elders and once representing the District Carter Center. And, and I believe, you may not agree with this, I believe that the North Koreans are now willing to give up their entire nuclear program and to negotiate a peace agreement with South Korea and the United States. That's, that's not exactly right with, with uh, China and the United States because the original uh, ceasefire that ended the Korean War was not with South Korea. And, and, and the United States is now pretty deeply in bed with South Korea, so we don't move on any element that relates to North Korea without approval from Seoul. So we are restrained unnecessarily, in my opinion, by moving from that. But I think that we ought to have direct talks with North Korea. We ought to find out what North Korea is willing to do, see if they will give up their nuclear weapons. if. The United States would recognize them diplomatically and have normal trade relations with them and lift the embargo that we've had now, for, as you pointed out, 60 years or so. So the, the, the situation is ripe for the resolution of that Korean Peninsula crisis. And I think the United States is the only entity that can bring that about, but it would take a change in our policy, at least to deal with the North Koreans in, in good faith. I think the North Koreans are ready based on my own experience in talking to them personally. Do you think you were ever a mainstream politician, or have you always been out on a limb? And why, <laughs> why aren't more people with you, given what you're espousing things that many ordinary people in Europe would probably support wholeheartedly? 
And yet in America, let's be fair, um, sometimes you wonder whether it's a good idea for you to turn up on a <laughs> candidate's door, you know, campaign. Well, I know that. Well, <laughs> you know, my position on, on Cuba and my position on North Korea and my position on Nepal and my position on, on the Mideast on, with Palestinians. Venezuela? And Venezuela. We've, we've monitored four elections in Venezuela. These are kind of outlaw regimes for the United States government. But I, since I left office, I've never been to a foreign country that I didn't first get approval from the White House. And I always let them know what my purpose is, is in going. When I return, I'm very meticulous. I write, my, I write my trip report on the way home. The next day, I send a full copy of my, of my activities to the White House, to the Secretary of State, and sometimes to the you know, Secretary General of the United Nations. But um, I don't have to deal with the, with the political pressures of the White House. But when and they see you coming, do you think they react with joy or a groan? Which one? <laughs> Where the I White go? House. Well, I mean, over the years. Well, when I go to Cuba, well, the Castro brothers are very eager to see me come. Yeah, no, no, I mean, but the George Bush, for example, sitting in the White House. Knocking. Well, it, it varies. It, I, and I'm being very frank with you in this private conversation. Of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had my best relationship uh, with George H.W. Bush, George Bush Sr and his Secretary of State, James Baker. And history would probably judge that he was a pretty good president. He was a very good president, and, and he was the closest to the Carter Center. Quite often, as a matter of fact, uh, president, then President Bush would ask the Carter Center to go to places that the gov uh, government of the United States didn't want to go to or couldn't go to. And then when I would return, he would ask me to come to the White House and meet with him and the Secretary of State and the Vice President and explain what we did. And uh, so that, that, that included the Mideast and, and dealing with the Palestinians. It, it also included going to other places. But uh, some of the uh, presidents, uh, understandably. What about Clinton? We did have a very good relationship with President Clinton. I think one of the reasons was that when he was uh, inaugurated president, the news media there, the Washington Post and New York Times, said that almost all of his foreign policy uh, members were Carter people. And this was Carter Redux, <laughs> reborn. And I think that President Clinton had a, a natural reaction against my intruding into the foreign policy of the United States. And I, I don't think I've ever uh, done anything of, of a secret nature that the President didn't know about. And sometimes the President might say, privately, I agree with you, what you advocate but I can't espouse that position because of other considerations that, that, I, don't, that I don't have personally as a private citizen. And has, I, I, has any I, American president ever said that of your, what you've said about Israel, for example? I would, I would guess, this is, uh, I would guess that, I believe, not based on his statement, I believe that President Obama privately agrees with our position on the Mideast. I think he expressed himself very clearly when he made his speech in Cairo saying no more settlements. And I think he, made it, he expressed himself very sincerely when he said earlier this year in May, the 67 borders have to prevail. I believe that's what he really believes. So is the pressure intolerable or yes. he's a weak man? The pressure is incredible and incomprehensible to anybody outside our country. I felt it when I was president. Uh, in fact, when I have met, after I left office with Prime Minister Netanyahu, he condemned me for having the peace treaty with Egypt, between Israel and Egypt, because he said I gave away the Sinai Desert to Egypt. And on that desert area, which belonged to Egypt, Israel had built two very large Air Force bases, a large settlement, and, and they had uh, also three oil wells that belonged to Egypt. And it's true, I gave them back to Egypt. But I think the resulting treaty has been good for both countries. But, but there are some people in Israel that disapprove of what I did, but I think they are in the minority. Let's take another question, this time from the microphone up there, number two. Mr. President, with the kind of economic collapse around the world and um, the kind of present economic distress we're in, um, as a venerable old man, what dreams do you dare dream for America? Amid the economic collapse, what dreams do you dare dream for America? Well, I think America still has the proper image 
of being a country that was founded on freedom, on democracy, on a heterogeneous population that historically welcomed immigrants, all of, most all of our ancestors are immigrants, mine happened to come from here. And so I think that the basic principles of America as a champion for peace and, and for human rights uh, will prevail in the future. Uh, those are the dreams that I have, and I think the American dream is, uh, what I just said, is, is the dream of a majority of my fellow citizens. Add your question. Susan Wolf, I live in London. I'm a registered Democratic voter from Wyoming. You, you, know, you mentioned the religious right, the rise of, of some of these, these, these things that are going on in the states. And this may be kind of an unfair question in, in the circumstances, but what do you think is the role of the media in all of this? And can you comment on what's happening with the American media right now? A good, good question. Role of the media in the rise of the religious right. Thank you very much. And, and the next question quickly from that mic. Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Faith Jegaday. I just wanted to ask you, um, John Snow at the beginning of the evening listed a list of your achievements and you've inspired people from my generation to my father's generation who's here tonight. I was wondering what is your greatest achievement and what achievement are you yet to achieve? Very good. Uh, the Democrat who asked about the role of the media in yeah. the stoking of the religious right the rise well, of the religious right. Well, I really feel that the, that the media in the Western world, particularly the United States and Great Britain, for instance, uh, should be and, and are free. They are diverse. And the United States now has a choice in media that we didn't have, for instance, when I was president. There were only three television stations in America, and they all had programs of a very limited nature. Now there's 24 hours of, uh, of television. And people that are naturally inclined to be conservative watch Fox. And those that are naturally inclined to be very liberal watch uh, MSNBC. And I maybe CNN is somewhere in between. So now I think that the polarization is, is enhanced by the media because people select the t particular coverage, news coverage they, 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 that matches their own philosophy. And Fox has become very popular, uh, and I think that uh, Fox has been one of the main reasons we've moved to the right in, uh, in political philosophy and also maybe the right wing uh, in, 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 uh, inclination to go uh, toward uh, more conservative religious leaders. Do you, say, do you appear on Fox often? No, I, I haven't been invited. Well, I own, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I'm often on Fox uh, news programs, but not on their talk shows, no. Right. Um, uh, and finally, the, the question, um, your greatest achievement, you only get a sentence each on this, uh, greatest achievement and the achievement you would most like to realize. Well, I, I think my greatest achievement and general, generality is keeping my country at peace. We had some very serious challenges when I was president, but we never were, we never dropped a bomb, we never launched a missile, we never fired a bullet in anger, and we tried to bring peace not only to my country, but to other nations around the world as well, including Egypt and Israel. So I would say the maintenance of peace was an important uh, achievement and, and, the, and the preservation of human rights. In the future, my main achievement that I hope to uh, realize is to eradicate guinea worm from the face of the earth. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for. But thank you very much indeed for your questions. And of course, a really very, very big thank you to you, President Carter, for giving us so much of your time.